Little of the 13th founding was spared imperial censors, and the umbral rates were no exception. Almost all information of the chapter comes from the inhabitants of the worlds they've saved or interactions they've had with other chapters. Across the centuries since the founding, the Inquisition has launched several investigations into the umbral rates. These investigations were meant to probe into the chapter's methods and motives. However, most of them have ended in dead ends and cold cases. The most conclusive and successful of these reports comes from the 39th millennium. Previous to that were several dated and contradictory records from the 36th millennium. What is known is that the Umbral Raids are a fleet-based successor chapter that patrols the fringes of Imperial space. To this day, neither their purpose nor even their Primarch is documented. In truth, almost entirely forgotten or unknown to many. Initially, the Umbral Raids were created as a powerful and versatile Xeno hunting Astartes chapter. Their purpose was to lend to aid various wings of the Imperium and to a lesser extent be the sword of the Imperium so desperately needed. While Death Watch and the Order of Xenos were to patrol the borders of Imperial space from Xeno incursion, the Umbral Wraiths were to dive into the territory and act as both Scout and Vanguard. The chapter was to be made of Dark Angel Seed and Ravengar Gene Seed. However, the Ravengar genetic material was too unstable and too precious for such an experiment, especially with the Death Spectres being produced within the same foundings. As a result, the Umbral Wraiths were given, instead, the vast and pure Night Lord gene stock stores under intense scrutiny classified seal. While the Dark Angel's significant and stable genes acted as the perfect counter to other gene seed's weaknesses, the combination of Lion and Night Hunter gene seed seemed to have created some unintentional effects. After successful gene implementation, specifically of the Suzanne membrane, neophytes are left in long comas. During these periods, which was once thought to be an accidental activation of the membrane, all Wraith neophytes dream of their fallen brother recruits. Such neophytes emerge with deep and impossibly vast knowledge of those who died at their side from their childhood of men from across their homeworlds to the intimate secrets of failed recruits born planets away. Many other chapters' librarians have since speculated this is a strange inversion of the famed Nightlord future site resulting from their classified gene mixture. The eye scalera is made deep black, but their iris turns a vivid and bright color of a lightened and white-tinted hue of their standard eye color. This, coupled with their skin becoming pale but not albino and their veins popping outward with an unsettling clarity in their strength and growth, give the chapter an undead appearance. This is only spurred on by the chapter's failed gene seed implants being thin and brittle as if drained of strength. Those who look on such failures remark that they seem almost skeletal and ancient despite only a few days old. A primarily unknown side effect to all but the most expert psychers and the Umbral Raids librarians is the effect their dual-natured gene seed has on the Umbral Raids souls. The souls of the Umbral Raids leave a signature trace in the warp, distinctly different from other humans and even space marines often remarked as a strange veil of confusion or darkness where one's very soul should be. It makes them hard to notice. It is not as if their souls are invisible in the warp, but more as if they melt into the background of their psychic surroundings. As such, they are difficult to contact astropathically and, more often than not, expose allied astropaths to longer and more dangerous dips into the warp. Conversely, this distinct signature is effortless to detect when one already knows what they are looking for. Experts in the warp and dedicated hunters find the raid souls like beacons in the dark instead of like cloaked daggers. Initially, the Umbral Raids were meant to creep through the galaxy's dark void and devastate targets, not unlike the Xeno species many believe the chapter was named after and were sanctioned by the Odo Xenos in their inception. Despite their thick tensions with the Inquisition now, the Umbral Wraiths were designed to be a transcendent tool in hunting Xenos and reinforcing the reach and might of the Order's chamber militant, Death Watch. Moreover, they were to scout and harass the enemies of mankind deep within their own territory, if not to reclaim worlds, then at least to grant the weakening Imperium a slight reprieve. Due partly to their heavily classified nature, none save the highest agents in the Inquisition's Ordo Xenos and Ordo Hereticus can know how successful they were in their initial release onto the galaxy. 
What is known is that they had in their inception been great assets to the Death Watch as intended. A few recovered documents indicate they have had several shrouded but nonetheless useful figures within the Watch. Moreover, they were supposedly a diverse information gathering web for the Odozinus until M38, when all reports stopped. Despite the silence, it is known the chapter still operates and exerts its information gathering skills upon its chosen area of patrol, seeking out and eliminating any Xenus incursions it finds within its grasps. A later report in M40 later discusses the propositions of a rising Inquisitor investigating the raids for the Ordo Xenus soon after his confirmed transfer to the Ordo Hereticus, a quote-unquote parting gift before his leave. It is unclear how correct the report's claims are. However, they are as a whole more reliable than the previous, most cited information on the matter of the rates, dating back to M37 and drenched in black ink and redactions. Since their creation in the 13th founding, these odd Astartes have wandered through Imperium space fringes. Even compared to the Dark Angels, they are particularly aloof, barely leaving recorded presence. However, as the Great Rift opened, they shifted their vigil from Imperial Space's edges to the Rift's borders. Currently, they are patrolling the Imperium Nihilus around their main recruitment world, Palatine. Palatine lies between Fenris and Bol and is a cardinal world that has faced most of the Imperium's enemies on more than one occasion. Orcish wars, Necron invasions, and of course demonic and chaos incursions. Without rest, they've been attempting to hold back whatever corrupt threats they can. At the end of the day, however, they are but one chapter. While they have broken numerous chaotic warbands apart and fended off several Xenus incursions, even their reach is limited. Throughout the millennium, the Umbral Wraiths use Mark VII and VI armor interchangeably and, in some cases, even mixing single suits. However, despite not having been a part of the Great Crusades themselves, they have also been documented wearing armor parts similar to Mark III and IV. Whether this is a simple, if not intricate, choice in design by their forge worlds and artifices, or a hint into their founding secrets, only they know for sure. Their chest is adorned with the Imperial Aquila, with their tabards and cloaks hosting the Umbral Raid sigil over top. Meanwhile, the plain right pauldron is typically marked with their troop designation, assault, tactical or devastator. Additionally, Umbral Raid's command staff and veterans are usually distinguished by a skull helm or special robes and tabards of subtly more ornate embroidery. It is hard to tell apart the company's veterans from their younger brothers without seeing their bloodwork unfold to untrained eyes. Herein, however, lies a vast departure from many of their brother chapters. The Umbral Raid's companies, post the first and excluding the tenth, all contain five veterans on loan from the first to serve as command staff and elites. Conversely, the first company is just 60 marines strong. These remaining marines, the Umbral Guardians, are the most elite of the chapter and are charged with protecting the fortress ministry, the Dark Cathedral, and its high-ranking officials such as Labinus, Emil, and Octavius. These guardians and their wards also serve as versatile and elite forces worth their weight in Xeno blood, even in their diminished numbers. Many gridlocked and losing battles have been turned once the guardians were given reign over the battlefield, safely relieved of their charges. The five veterans of any detachment are granted additional adornments, such as extra markings on their troop designation and engraved laurel wreaths or fur manes on their helms. Conversely, the Umbral Guardians are adorned with special honors to distinguish them from the other veterans as the chapter's honor guard. All of the Guardians possess a cape dyed a vivid teal hue, adorned with a symbolic recounting of their most extraordinary deeds, often with strange aberrations at their center. When such a Guardian dies, in addition to funerary rites and long mourning silences, it is customary to remove and enshrine their skull no matter its condition within the cathedral. Their capes are carefully draped over imposing stone pedestals, and their final moments are carved into both the chapter's memory and the rite of remembrance. The ancient rite of the remembrance attempt to stroke and stir the spirits of their fallen from wherever they may lie and grant the living the power to remind their foes of both their dead steeds and righteous anger. Such rites are both the charge of the company's ancients and chapter chaplains, as both posts demand the living look to the future but never forget the past. 
to recover a rate's body, especially a guardian's, for this purpose is a deep and guttural priority to all umbral rates, for to let their best and brightest rot is an insult to all whom they have ever served. These rites attempt to remember the dead and bolster the living, but more than that, they try to summon their honored dead spirits and borrow their prowess in the recollection of such deeds. Often, the most celebrated exploits even require either sacrifice and offering from the enemy or channeling through the remains of their honored dead. Upon completion, the raids seem to move in haunting silence, as though they were the hero of old or gain a sense of prowess they did not possess moments ago. Be it greater swordsmanship, improved accuracy, or even sorcerers but straightforward increases to speed or strength, such effects, however, are short-lived as the dead are gone and even in their brotherhood cannot stay in the material forever. This occult reverence for the fallen heroes of mankind is deeply instilled into them from their gene seed implementation. It is primarily to blame for their strained relations with most branches of the Imperial War Machine. Untold numbers of Adeptus Militarum Guardsmen report feeling an unnatural sense of gloom or dread radiating around the chapter's marines. This all-imposing anxiety only seems to be overpowered by the awe and wonder any Guardsman will have for the Astartes in open combat but is otherwise oppressive in between operations. However, to the Militarum's credit, the Umbral Raids are distant and apathetic to most non-military positions within the Imperium. Such behaviors are the product of an avid disdain for weakness and cowardice against the enemy. To the Umbral Raids, such feelings spit on those who have died to keep the Imperium safe thus far. This reverence does not stop with the chapter's own brothers either, extending out to the droves of guardsmen that have died holding lines and biding time as well as other chapters and the untold number of the Imperium's fighting forces. As a fleet-based chapter, the Umbral Raid's fortress ministry and flagship are the same. However, theirs is no standard battle barge. Some time ago, the Umbral Raid's amidst the desolate stars of deep space was given by the Emperor, or perhaps the Omnissiah, their venerated fortress ministry, an abandoned space hulk from the Dark Age of Technology. Dubbed the Dark Cathedral, the space hulk was once a proud mining vessel. It would chase and break down asteroids and other celestial bodies in its gloried past to bring its bounty back to its homeworld. It contains several powerful industrial technologies that give the chapter efficient means for self-repair. Moreover, within its ancient halls were numerous Terminator armor suits, once used for mining but now for war. This Goliath's mighty hull is covered in rock and debris from its long drifting sleep within the void. Where others might have seen this as a sign of age or a blemish, a reminder of humanity's struggle, the raids see but another gift. The hallowed halls grow silent as the lights dim and darken when all non-essential systems are powered down and minimized, showing only these very stones and rocks clinging to its hull. With a lowered power output, the blessed battleship returns to looking like nothing but a lowly remnant of humanity's past. Unsuspecting and inconspicuous, the raids use this deception to lure in or slip past foe's sights and into the rear of enemy formations. From there, the guns and gunships tear apart enemy fleets and transports before any can react, powering their gloried fortress ministry and deploying their full might from the darkness of space. Before the Great Rift opened, the Umbral raids were a vanguard force on a single, if not dual-natured mission. They would wander the edges of Imperial space, attempting to weaken and cull forces before they could pierce into Imperium territories. As such, many of the chapter's actions in this long period have gone unnoticed or otherwise unsung. Either the enemy never made it past them or were ultimately felled by another chapter. When the Great Rift opened, the raids were engaging a small flotilla of Necrons before being swallowed by the rent in space. Caught in the ensuing warp storms and vortexes of the Cicatrix Maledictum as it wrecked across the galaxy, the chapter had barely made it back to the Dark Cathedral in time to escape mass extermination. For the next ten years, they fought from stern to bow against an unending tide of lesser and greater demons. Only after Labinus slew a mighty and familiar horror of the warp in the hangar of the cathedral. In his overtaken rage, a surge of zealous faith washed over the remaining Umbral Raids, and the flagship was able to stir itself from the warp's immaterial grip of the ship. 
they race back to the Palatine without delay nor rest, only to find it besieged by chaotic bands of night lords. At that moment, the Astartes lamented. It seemed as if the world they held so dear, the world many called home, would be lost forever. It was silent on the ship, a morning silence that seemed unbreakable, until the Vox sounded. A strange group of marines on the surface, proud in their umbral rakes colors, hailed them for reinforcements. As the bridge held its breath in amazement, wonder and confusion, all in equal measure, the hesitation was cut by Labinus standing tall and commanding a forward rush into the Night Lord's fleet. As he roared his orders, his brothers could feel their chapter master's faith, valor, and, of course, his relief wash over them. Then, spurred on by Emil, the chapter rushed forward with a speed and precision that seemed fantastical, like a lucid dream, even to other Astartes. Critical to understanding the Umbral Raid's organizational structure is knowing how different they operate versus other fleet-based chapters. Unlike their star-sailing brethren, the Raids never stray too far from the Dark Cathedral and continuously work in web-like formations spanning no more than a few systems or sectors. This hesitation to extend a distance comes from their past experiences, most notably the chapter's bloodiest night, a day that marked the loss of their chapter master and most of their second company. As such, the Umbral Raids, under chapter master Labinus, strive to remain within reach of each other at all times, ever wary of being caught out again, and are more cooperative and codependent than most other fleet-based chapters. After joining together with their Primaris reinforcements post the Long Night, the Umbral Raids once again reorganized to incorporate their new battle brothers into their recently wounded but hardened ranks. This addition did them no favors with the Inner Circle and the Unforgiven chapters. First Company, the Umbral Guardians Only 60 Marines strong, the Umbral Guardians are the most venerable veterans of the chapter and serve to defend the Dark Cathedral with the 10th Company and the chapter's indispensable figures, such as the Chapter Master, Choir Minister, and the High Interrogator and Master of Librarians. The first is led by Chapter Master Labinus himself, as the only lieutenant of the 60 Marines Strong First Company, however, Company Master Cassius serves as Master of the Guard, directing the other veterans and the Umbra Guardians in their mission to protect the chapter's heroes and commanders. Uniquely, the Guardians do not serve as the chapter's Deathwing nor Ravenwing, but are instead drawn so that only the most veterans of the chapter's inner circle carry the burden of its command. Second Company, the Revenants. 105 Marines strong, 20 of whom are Primaris Marines, with 100 from the second company and 5 veterans from the first in permanent command and advisory positions. The Umbral Raid's primary battle company, the Revenants, serves as a first force into near all of the chapter's majority planetary engagements and the last troops to be pulled out. Second only to the first in raw battlefield experience, they drop onto the battlefield to quickly control tactical locations and dominate the battlefield after that. As such, they have long fielded a combination of tactical and assault marines to promptly advance the enemy positions. Recently, these experienced assault marines and tactical marines have been joined by their new Primaris brothers, typically in intercessor and interceptor formations, holding the flanks of the tip of any ongoing rush needed. Additionally, it is the second company that acts the chapter's raven wing in the secret hunt for the fallen. Third company, the Poltergeists. 105 marines strong, 10 of whom are Terminators and 30 of whom Primaris, with 100 being the third company's marines and 5 veterans being from the first in permanent command and advisory roles. The Umbral Raid's most notorious company, the Poltergeists, are masters of shipboarding and infiltration. While they are equal to the second in combat experience, their tactics have garnered the Umbral Raid's infamy among enemy navies. They serve to infiltrate and sabotage enemy vessels and strongholds from the dark of night or in the silence of space with frightening precision. More terrifyingly, their intrusions have always been silent, swift and destructive. Even before introducing their Primaris Reavers and Excursors, the third had long rivaled even the Raven Guard in their infiltration and execution of high-valued enemy positions and targets. Reinforced with their new battle brothers, these hunters in the heavens have become all the more terrifying. With 30 Primaris in the Reavers and infiltrator formations, the Poltergeists have been granted a boon they did not need but welcome. 
Unlike other Dark Angel successes, it's the third company that serves as the chapter's death wing. Just as the second hunts the fallen with their shock assault and fast attacking vehicle pull, the third crushes the enemy in brutal opening gambits or cunning teleport strikes. The third is led by chapter ancient Dimitri. As the company's ancient, but the chapter's ancient, rumor claims Dimitri has the most enduring memory of any battle brother. Moreover, some tales attest that his soul has endured more than any other while his body may be young. No matter the truth, no wraiths are forgotten between him and the rest of his hallowed brothers on the sepulchres, and what's more, no wraith goes uncalled and unhonored. Fourth Company, The Whites 105 Marines strong, 30 of whom are Terminators and 20 of whom are Primaris Marines, with 100 of the total number of Marines from the 4th Company and 5 veterans from the 1st in permanent command and advisory roles. As the Umbral Raid's secondary battle company, the Whites often support the Revenants in combat. They are most often deployed soon after the 2nd Company to advance in supporting positions. The Whites most often prefer to guard the rear of the Revenants and secure their flanks. However, when deployed alone, they engage in vicious multi-pronged flanking maneuvers to break down and tear into enemy formations, systematically eliminating them. As such, the Primaris favor incursor and suppressor roles to assist in more prolonged assaults and shorter spearheads, respectively. Fifth Company, the Dragger. 105 Marines strong, 20 of whom are Terminators, 100 of the total of Marines from the 5th Company, and 5 veterans from the 1st in permanent command and advisory roles. As the 3rd Battle Company of the Umbral Raids, the Draugr are deployed to hold captured positions and provide long-range fire support to the other companies. They are comprised of a small contingent of tactical Marines meant to support the company's considerable force of Devastator Marines and additional vulnerable fire support. Within this company, the chapter's precious few centurion, once a part of the second, these suits are expertly utilized within the fifth to maximize their defensive firepower and provide an increased effective range. While they have no brother Primaris yet, the fifth company is never without a plan. The Draugr Eversharp Minds plan as naturally as anyone might breathe and have already prepared positions and appointments for their new brothers. Should the day come, they are reinforced. Primaris Marines are to enter battle in Aggressor and Hellblaster formations. Sixth Company, the Liches. 105 Marines strong, 10 of whom are Apothecaries, and 15 are Librarians, with 100 of the total number of Marines are the Sixth Company, and 5 veterans from the first in permanent command and advisory roles. While not a battle company, they are a support company, sent in after the Second and Third Companies when necessary. The Liches are focused support with a portion of the chapter's apothecaries and most of its librarians. They are most often held within the cathedral and are quickly dispatched to other companies on demand to counter Chaos forces and Xena's threats. When free, however, they dismantle enemy ships with a third to gain and forward intelligence on the enemy movements. Beneath this glimmer and glamour, however, there lies a secret kept by the chapter. Octavius, the master of librarians, and his brothers do not just map enemy ship designs, a practice already pushing the limits of acceptability in the Inquisition's eyes. The Six also captures and reverse engineers the arms and armor of their enemies with the Tenth Company deep within the Dark Cathedral's catacombs. This scientific understanding of enemy's equipment, which the Umbral Raids capitalize on and use to enhance their strikes, is, in their minds, a secret well worth the risk of inquisitorial ire, but a risk nonetheless. The Six commands officially most librarians, but they are often deployed to other companies. Those that remain do so under the vigil of Octavius, the High Librarian of the chapter. He and the Sixth typically act as reinforcements to the battlefield companies and engage in low-threat missions or mysterious nature. Many of the Sixth's notable tasks include recovering Archaeotech with the Tenth, or warding and destroying places of Chaos worship and screening for any demonic influences. Born on the desert world of Metallum Harane, with Exitor, the chapter's master of Forge, Octavius had always been in tune with this latent psychic connection. Metallum Harane, or just Harane Prime as the Imperium has filed it, was a feudal world dominated by theocratic governments praising the golden god of machines and might, and nomadic bands that refused to submit to the church. Octavius was one such scavenger, but he was not your average ruffian. 
Even from a young age, he and Exeter had felt their callings. Exeter could feel and innately commune with machine sprites, and Octavius had a natural calling to the war and machine discipline. Valued survivors and brothers in arms, one day the two couldn't explain it then, but they could feel the machine spirits of the Umbral Raid's war gear and battle barges overhead, and raced across the continent to reach them. The rest is history now. The two miraculously became space marines and valued veterans and paragons of the chapter, even after Exeter became a tech marine. Now Octavius is the High Librarian and Master of the Librarius. When the Primaris made contact with Wraiths, Octavius couldn't contain his boundless curiosity, as if he ever could, and underwent the process to cross the Rubicon Primaris. When many others, particularly High Apothecary, Elitha, tried to talk them out of it, he only replied, We cannot connect to our brothers if we cannot understand them, nor can they understand us. So how can we be brothers if we cannot know the other's position? Thus, I shall bridge us. Besides, I'm rather excited to feel the work of the Archmagus and Primarch myself. 7th Company, the Ghouls 105 marines strong, 30 of whom are apothecaries, 100 of the total number of marines from the 7th Company, and 5 veterans from the 1st in permanent command and advisory roles. The Ghouls are a supporting company of the chapter that serves both to help reconstruct any world the battle companies aid in their endless vigil of Imperium Nihilus and the companies themselves. The Seventh Company is also responsible for recovering Gene Seed and gathering and training recruits from the Umbral Raids recruitment worlds. Due to this, their role is preparing and applying Gene Seed, the Seventh boasts many apothecaries often sent out to the other companies on near permanent loans. Other notable quirk lies within the Umbral Raid's unprecedentedly low number of recruitment worlds, even by Dark Angel standards. For these few and closely held recruitment worlds, the Seventh has self-imposed the duty to watch over these worlds and assist in their defense, often leaving one apothecary on each of the three recruitment worlds to aid in their recruitment and prosperity. Currently, the Raids maintain three recruitment worlds, with a large majority of recruits coming from the planets Casbar and Palatine. Eighth Company, the Dulahan. 105 Marines strong, 100 from the Eighth Company, 20 of whom are Primaris, and five veterans from the First in permanent command and advisory roles. Furthermore, the Dulahan manage and deploy the Scout Marines race and ready for further specialized training and gene seed implementation, but are not fully Astartes. They are a reserved company, often sent as messengers, reinforcements, or aids to the brother companies and even sections of the Imperium's various other forces. The Dulahan have also, across the millennia, scouted for the Umbral Raids and hunted for the Fallen. While the company relays all of its findings back to the chapter, preferring to do so via messengers over astropaths whenever possible, the Dulahans are incredibly diligent with information on the Fallen. Whenever such information is found, the company prioritizes sending such information back above all other matters. It has even been known to risk astropathy and discovery from the Dark Gods. Moreover, much to the Imperious foe's woe, the Eighth has only been bolstered by their Primaris reinforcements. Where once they had been chiefly recon and intel gathering specialists with a small contingent of marines to act on time-sensitive intelligence, the Dulahans now have the means to strike out against their foes from a distance or in close quarters attacks with their Eliminator and Eradicator Primaris. Ninth Company, the Banshees. 105 marines strong, 25 of whom are tech marines, with 100 of the total number of marines from the 9th company, and 5 veteran Astartes from the 1st company in permanent command and advisory positions. These are both the chapter's technicians, hosting many tech marines, and their leading supporting company, for it is the 9th that maintains and deploys the vast majority of the chapter's vehicle pool. Thus, they are often deployed alongside the other companies to assist in vehicular transport and support. When alone, however, few can stand up to the raw firepower of the Ninth and their close combined arms tactics. Tenth Company, the Umbral Quarry. 100 Marines strong, 50 of whom are tech marines, all under the command of their own staff who work with and typically under the First Company in defense of the Dark Cathedral. The Tenth is led by the chapter's choir minister, Exitor. The choir minister is the Umbral Raid's master of the forge. He is responsible for the Dark Cathedral's upkeep and the chapter's comprehensive vehicle pools whenever they are not employed or nurtured by the Ninth. 
Furthermore, Exitor has also expanded the company's duties and its role as minister in maintaining the company's arsenal to that of the vast Terminator stores found within the Dark Cathedral storm and halls years ago. While many chapters tend to distance themselves from their techmarines and masters of the forge, especially that of the Dark Angels, the Umbral Raids have had increasingly troubled relations with the Mars Mechanicum. As such, treasure its techmarines and local Forge World Mechanicum branches. This trust and this endearment are not unrequited, however. Where other Techmarines feel dual loyalties to the Mechanicum and their chapter, the Umbral Raids Techmarines hold a commitment to their chapter first and that of the Forge Worlds within the Vigil, not to the Priest of Mars. For in their minds, the Umbral Raids are one of, if not the last, of the Emperor's children to seek out science and reason over zeal and faith. Thus, serving the Umbral Raids, Exitor and Octavius serves as the Omnisires sincerely wills it, not as the Haggards and Hoarders that Mars envision it. While the Umbral Raids do not boast their achievements, many thoughtful minds and eyes have been able to compile a list of their operations based on the absence of any other chapters. They've halted several splintering and vanguard forces from War Nasdrak, including one that made it to their recruitment world of Infrangible. They were responsible for the evacuation of planet Inanis' inhabitants from Necrons and subsequent escorts of a lost sister of Silence found their back to Holy Terra on the recall orders of Gilliman. After regrouping on Terra, they were crucial allies to the sister of Silence and custodial strike force in the retaking and subsequent exterminating of the world. The purging of the Forge World Nartals after an invasion from a Chaos Warband starting with the destruction of their amassing fleet. While the ever suspicious and mistrusting Dark Angels and the many unforgiven chapters of the Inner Circle were not quick to accept a chapter from the 13th founding, even as the Umbral Wraiths were first emerging, they did eventually come to receive them. Since then, the nature of the chapter's gene seed has remained an ever-present topic among the Circle, who are always quick to note the Umbral Wraiths' departure from standard Dark Angels templates. Nevertheless, the mysterious chapter of Astartes has proven themselves capable of defending the Imperium, especially in the eternal hunt for the Fallen.